Hey there, is today your first time here? Or maybe your first time in a while? If so, maybe you're wondering exactly who we are and what this church is all about. Well, we'd like you to know that we're a group of ordinary people who are on an amazing journey together, following Christ. Our guide is the Bible because it's the divinely inspired Word of God and it will never take us in the wrong direction. Along the way, we hope you'll see that we are welcoming and spiritually passionate and that getting to know you is a big deal to us. We know that the road is rough sometimes, but we'll work really hard to bring you practical and relevant messages to equip and encourage you through life's ups and downs. We want you to know that we care about this community and we believe that it's our job to make it a better place. So no matter who you are or where you've been, we're glad you're here with us today. And we hope that you'll join us on our journey, following Christ and living out His plan for us. So welcome to church. Good morning, Connections. It's a beautiful morning. The snow is melting. The sun is out. It's a perfect mood to worship God. Why don't we all rise if we're in the room and offer the Lord our praise. Who breaks the power? Who breaks the power of sin and darkness? Whose love is mighty and so much stronger? The King of glory, the King above all kings. Who shakes the whole earth with holy thunder? Who leaves us breathless in awe and wonder? The King of glory, the King above all kings. This is amazing grace. This is unfailing love. That you would take my place. That you would bear my cross. You laid down your life. That I would be set free. Whoa, Jesus, I sing for all that you've done for me. Who brings our chaos? Who brings our chaos back into order? Who makes the orphan a son or daughter? The King of glory, the King of glory, who rules the nations with truth and justice, shines like the sun and all of its brilliance. The King of glory, the King of Yeah. 
Jesus, I sing for all that you've done for me. We thank you, Jesus, for your amazing grace, for your amazing grace. Give the Lord a hand this morning. Well, welcome to Connections. Like we said, we're going to resume back to worship, so hold on to that spirit because you know it's here. All you've got to do is grab onto it. You don't even have to invite it. It's already here. We're going to get into some announcements, and we're super excited to welcome some new members. Uh, so why don't we all just uh, have a seat, say hi to one another, good morning, uh, and then we'll get back into it. Good morning, everyone. My name is Ruth Volkers, and this is Janelle Tracy. We would like to welcome you to Connection Church, a church that connects you with your calling to love God, love people, and to do something. So we would love to stay connected with you with this week. And then the easiest way to do that is by following us on social media. You are welcome to take out your phone right now if you haven't followed up on Facebook, or YouTube, or Instagram. We also love hearing from you, and this is the great way to keep up the conversation. The other way to get connected is to receive a weekly email from church. If you haven't received any email, please let Pastor George know so he can include you on his mailing list. There are other several things going on today. We hope we can stay for the love feast after church today. There are a lot of yummy food, and we want to celebrate our new members at church. So please stay for the love feast after the service today. And we are having a Super Bowl party for the young adults at Barbara and Marie's house this afternoon at 4.30. And if you are young adult, you know, you can define who is the young adult. And then you can come, and then please let me know or Barb know. You can check our website or the Connections weekly email for all the information about weekly or Sunday Bible studies. It is a reminder that we have congregational meeting on Sunday, February 27th. After church service, we are very excited to introduce Anna Cho Park and share about our up, up, upcoming. So please stay on February 27th after church service for, to introduce Anna Cho Park as part of our staff. And today, Pastor George will preach on the story of Jesus walking on the water. So like all the miracles, this is a sign that tells us about Jesus as the creator of the world, who also is our deliverer, taking us out of captivity. Let us pray. Thank you, God, for this amazing day, and hope our love feast is going well. We thank for the children, and thank you for everything. And we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thanks so much, ladies. Well, I have the joy right now of welcoming up some new members to join us here at Connection. So if you want to come on up and join us, those who have stepped forward and are planning. Now, as the background uh, for this celebration, we had some membership classes in the fall. Get on up here, Cheryl. Get on up here, Tim. And I think Anna and Paul are going to join us here. Um, and I don't know if Maddie and Ryder, or they're probably back in the kids' ministry so we had the joy of welcoming a bunch of new members just before Christmas, and then we had another session of our um, Connect With Your Calling membership class. Uh, of course, this doesn't oblige you to join the church. It's an opportunity for you to learn more about the church and for us to learn more about you and what God is doing in your life. And I do want to highlight, whenever we do have celebrations uh, like this where we welcome new members, this is in no way intended to ever exclude anybody who's new or is visiting, is exploring the Christian faith with us, of course you're welcome here. But this is a way to highlight that whenever we say we want to be your church, that I want to be your pastor, that we want to worship together, serve together, do life together, and you come forward and say you want to do life together with us, we just want to take that seriously and we also want to celebrate that uh, decision in people's lives. So uh, I'll just start over here tonight. So we welcome Anna and Paul and they've got two uh, awesome little kids, Maddie and Ryder, who are probably 
actually back in the uh, kids' ministry right now. Paul has already been teaching a lot of our kids in the ministry back there. And uh, as Ruth just announced on Sunday February 27th, we are very excited that we want to do a more formal introduction of Anna here, and Anna is going to be taking lead with our worship ministry. So can we thank God for that already? So, um, but we want to give you guys the chance to get to know her and speak into her and uh, all that good stuff. And then over here, we got Tim and we got Cheryl, and they've got uh, three kids, and their kids are up and doing stuff and living their life. So, uh, but Topher and uh, Lily and, uh, and, and what was your... And Molly, yeah, and Molly's married, so she's off on the other side of the country now. But Tim and Cheryl have been doing life with us for over a year now, and we're just really excited to welcome you guys officially to uh, Connections Church and the membership here. Now, you guys are both, like, on, on the other side of me, so um, let, let's fix this. Maybe, maybe you guys come over there and... Uh, one of the things that, of course, we do is we just want to ask you kind of the questions of, of membership, and it's kind of a recommitment to the faith and to the church. And so here we go. Uh, do you affirm once again that Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior, that the Bible is God's word revealing Christ and his redemption, and that the teaching of this church reflect this revelation? If so, please say, we do. Do you promise to join with us now, sharing in your gifts, in our worship and fellowship and outreach, serving in this mission that God has given us in his world? If so, please say, we do. And now to the congregation of Connections Church. Do you promise to receive Paul and Anna and Tim and Cheryl and their families, to love them as brothers and sisters in Christ, to support them with your fellowship and prayers, to recognize their gifts and invite them into the life and mission of our congregation? If so, please say, we do. Amen. Then, amen. Let's say a prayer and let's celebrate. Yes, do that. And now let's, uh, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do celebrate that you are calling people to your church. And we know that that word church, um, you know, it, it covers a lot. You welcome us to the body of Christ, to the mission that you are fulfilling in the world. You welcome us to this fellowship of brothers and sisters as we join together with you, our Savior and Lord. And for this, we are so grateful. So again, we ask you to just bless our church, bless our congregation, bless the mission that we serve into our community. And we look forward to seeing what you will uh, unfold in the days and the weeks and the seasons to come as we follow you faithfully uh, in every season of our lives. We pray this in your name, Lord Jesus. Amen. All right, friends, let's continue to worship our God. And I guess we have to give on a second to get back to the keys. Get back to work. Come on. We're not hiring you for nothing. So get, get up there and lead us. So <laughs> thanks, Paul. Why don't we rise again? This morning we worship a God of compassion, of mercy, the only God who can save through his son Jesus. Everyone needs compassion. Everyone needs compassion, a love that's never failing. Let mercy fall on me. Everyone needs forgiveness. The kindness of a Savior, the hope of nations. Savior, Savior, he can move the mountains. Our God is mighty to save. He is mighty to save forever. Author of salvation, heroes and conquered the grave. Jesus conquered the grave. Take me as you find me. So take me as you find me. All my fears and failures fill my life again. 
I give my life to follow everything I believe in. Now I surrender. I surrender. My Savior, Savior, He can move the mountains. My God is mighty to save. He is mighty to save forever. Author of salvation, He rose and conquered the grave. Jesus conquered the grave. Shine your light, shine your light, and let the whole world see. We're singing for the glory of the risen King. Jesus, shine your light, and let the whole world see. We're singing for the glory of the risen King. We're singing. Shine your light and let the whole world see. We're singing for the glory of the risen King. Jesus, shine your light and let the whole world see. We're singing for the glory of the risen King. Savior, Savior, He can move the mountains. Our God is mighty to save. He is mighty to save forever. Author of salvation, he rose and conquered the grave. Jesus conquered the grave. Shine your light, shine your light, and let the whole world see. We're singing for the glory of the risen King. Jesus, shine your light and let the whole world see. We're singing for the glory of the risen King. Our Father. Our Father everlasting, the all-creating one, God Almighty. And through your Holy Spirit, conceiving Christ the Son, Jesus our Savior. I believe in God our Father. I believe in Christ the Son. I believe in the Holy Spirit. Our God is three in one. I believe in the resurrection that we will rise again. For I believe in the name of Jesus. We believe, Lord, in your power, resurrection. Our judge and our defender suffered and crucified. Forgiveness is in you. Descended into darkness, you rose in glorious light, forever seated high. I believe in God our Father, I believe in Christ the Son, I believe in the Holy Spirit, our God is three in one. I believe in the resurrection that we will rise again. For I believe in the name of Jesus. I believe in you. I believe you rose again. Jesus Christ 
Father, thank you. Thank you for giving us something to believe in truly. Not just believe in, but rely on. Many times we believe in things that fall short, that don't offer us what they promise. But this time we can rest assured that your spirit is here and our belief is enough. Our belief is enough for you to make us what we're supposed to be in you. We ask this morning that you soften our hearts and open our minds for what Pastor George has to teach us. Work through him, work into us, and bring your peace into this place. We accept it, we receive it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You guys can be seated, and as you do, can we, uh, Carlos, I, I hear something big is happening in your life in one month. Who said that? I did. You're getting, Carlos is getting married in one month, everybody. Congratulations, Carlos. We'll have a bachelor party. We're going to celebrate like it's the end of your life. All right. So... I didn't say that. No, hey, no, marriage is awesome. It's a beautiful thing. We are so happy for you. I know a great pastor who officiates weddings, so if you need anything, uh, let, me, let me know. Man, there is so much going on. There's like weddings going on and new members coming and food out there. There is so much going on. Who here is most excited because it is Valentine's Day weekend? Who is here most excited for that? Oh uh, boy, not a lot of really loving <laughs> romantic people here. Okay, who's most excited because the Olympics are in the, you know, in the midst of the Olympics and no, all right, people are all right. A couple of people kind of care. Who here is most excited about the Super Bowl? Okay, I, I, that was like that was like crickets. That was like you know, like a tumbleweed rolled across the stage. Who here? Okay, well, we're going to have some fun with that. Who here is in it for the Rams? Anybody? Anybody? All right. Who here is in it for the Bungles? Anybody? Anybody? Oh, more Bungles fans there. Who here is in it for the halftime show with Snoop Dogg and Eminem and Dr. Dre? Yeah, I mean, that is, that's not why I'm watching it at all as a child of the 90s. That's not what I care most about, that halftime show. Uh, I will only say this. I am not an expert on betting, but uh, if I was going to hedge my bets and, and place a wager on this game, I think I would still vote for Tom Brady. Somehow he is going to show up and somebody's going to rip off off their helmet, it's going to be him, and he's going to win MVP because the record of the Rams and the Bungles, I mean, doesn't come yeah, anywhere close to Brady, so I'd just go in for, for him. Uh, what else is happening here? Okay, who's most excited about Jesus? Okay, all right, there you go. Pandering to the pastor, I love that. Everybody who's here is most excited about Jesus. That was the right answer. That is why we're here. That's why we come forward to worship this morning. I want to make a a special little um, plea, though, right now um, before I pray and we get into uh, God's word here. Um, 
so Robin and some of the women of the church last fall did a wonderful study on the first half of the books of, book of Exodus. And they're all like, this is a great study. You should do it with the men. And I said, yes, I should. And so we started a Wednesday night Bible study. And I, I just have to call out my men of the church. Uh, where are you? Where, why are you not here? Why are you not studying the Bible with me? Why are you not praying with me? Why are you not doing mission with me? Why are you not serving with me? Why are you abandoning me, men of the church? I'm taking this as a grave personal insult. I really want the men of the church to come together and to grow in Christ and to serve our Lord. To that end, uh, I was talking with a couple of the guys who showed up. Thank you, Tim and Mike, the greatest, godliest men in the congregation. Um, we're so small, like everybody is like, gonna hate me by the end of today. <laughs> I will have insulted everyone before today's over, by the way. So here's what we're gonna do. Uh, we're gonna cook a, a really good breakfast, uh, pancakes, bacon, coffee, some good stuff. Uh, we're, we're gonna talk uh, and have a Bible study. And then we are going to talk about what is going to work for you, what morning, what evening, what events are going to work for you. We want to know, we want you to show up, we want you to step up, we want you to get engaged. Uh, we want to make this something that you want to do and you are looking forward to being a part of. So please join us and participate with that and let us know how we can serve the men of our church better. And then please go to Moab with me and some others uh, later then uh, in the spring. That's always a great trip and we'll get that stuff going and we will grow in Christ together. Whoo, all right. Now that I've um, insulted everyone, let me say a prayer, ask for forgiveness and God's blessing and we'll get into the reading of God's word. Uh, Heavenly Father, again, I'm reminded that you have already blessed your word, and so now we as your people come to you to speak to us now the living word. May your spirit be upon me, and may your spirit work in everyone gathered here so that we can receive the revelation of your truth uh, into our lives so that we might be convicted, we might be edified, we might not always simply be better equipped to be the people that you are calling us to be. We pray this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, and all God's people said, amen. Whoo, thank you. With that, I better just read God's word and get back on track here. We are jumping back into the gospel of John now and continuing through the miracles. Remember, the gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, that tell us about the life and the ministry of Jesus Christ. In John's gospel, the latest gospel, it's the most curated of the gospels because he's telling a story to really pull some themes and some things together for us. And as such, he only highlights seven miracles. And really, most of them are unique, except what we had talked about actually last fall and then touched upon a little bit last week, the feeding of the 5,000. And today's miracle, Jesus walking on water. All of the other ones actually are unique to John's gospel. But each of these are also unique because John is highlighting them as signs. Yes, they're miracles. They're suspensions of or overreaching the world of the natural. And he is showing us so that they're not just these miracles, of course, they're signs. And signs give us some information, signs give us some instruction. A sign is always telling us something, and it's telling us something what we should do in response to that information. So we're learning some things about Jesus, who he is, why he came, what he's able to do, what he is doing, and how we live then in light of that information. With that said, again, this is John's telling of the story of Jesus walking on water from uh, chapter six here, we'll pick up. When evening came, oh, I just lost it. When evening came, his disciples went down to the lake where they got into a boat and set off across the lake for Capernaum. By now it was dark and Jesus had not yet joined them. A strong wind was blowing and the waters grew rough. When they had rowed about three or four miles, they saw Jesus approaching the boat, walking on the water. And they were frightened, rightfully so. But he said to them, it is I, don't be afraid. Then they were willing to take him into the boat. And immediately the boat reached the shore where they were heading. Now I gotta tell you a secret. It's actually not too hard to walk on water. 
I've done it many times. You've done it many times. Of course, everybody knows, you know, you're walking on snow, you're walking on ice. Technically speaking, you're walking on water. And people will come up with all kinds of creative ways to try and explain this, which is clearly a miraculous endeavor, walking on water. But I will tell one anecdote before I swing back to the deeper stuff of the message and God's word for us. Uh, it was a couple uh, years ago, about 12 years ago, uh, now that uh, we are in Canada, we are planting uh, the church up there and it the last day that the local ski resort was open they always had a puddle jump Everybody, anybody ever do a puddle jump where you like see all right tim has done it it's great well i'll take it we'll go up to winter park we'll do it again this year it's always a great time so uh it was after church one sunday i said hey our whole family are going to go and do the puddle jump over at the bowler bump and so like a ton of people from the church showed up and so uh, we all lined up and it was a bunch of little kids in front of me and they're like skiing down. They're just like crashing into the water, just one after the other. It, it was hilarious. And then, and then I came ripping down uh, that hill. And of course, I just went flying across the water. Actually, I have a video of it, but we couldn't find it online. I'll find it at some point and repost it. And I went flying across the water and, and all this stuff. Now, the point of this, why I wanted to tell this story is the local paper was there. And they said, who is this guy? And they asked, uh, who is this guy to a guy whose name is John Vandersteen? And John Vandersteen is Joy's uncle, who we knew, talk about a small world. It was, it was Joy's uncle. And John Vandersteen said to the newspaper, that's my pastor. He walks on water because I just skimmed across. I mean, and the paper, they actually put that in the local newspaper, pastor walks on water. It was the greatest moment of my life. I mean, I will probably never, you know, do anything more wonderful in my life than that moment, the pastor. So really, we can try and explain this away. Give somebody enough velocity, give them enough speed and a couple of planks on their feet. And sure, you are going to walk on water. But we know that, again, this is pointing out something about Jesus who is not, this isn't a trick. This isn't magic. This isn't illusion. This isn't flying down a hill to skim over the pond. This is Jesus really walking on water. So the question is, what is this going to tell us? How does this become a sign for us, for understanding and embracing Jesus all the more. John also gives us the insight whenever he starts uh, telling this story. It says that after the feeding of the 5,000, the crowd was ready to make Jesus their king. Now, Jesus, knowing that this is about to happen, uh, he knows it is not yet his time. His time will come about a year from now, and he will not become a king like any of the people were wanting to crown him. He would become the king who would come forward to die the death that we deserve, become the sacrifice that we couldn't be, to pay the price that we couldn't earn, to achieve the forgiveness and the resurrection that was out of our reach. And so Jesus is fulfilling his call to be king in a way that the people were still not expecting. And knowing that they wanted to make him king and make a big deal of this, he sends the people away. He goes up on a mountain to pray because originally, if we want to remember just a little farther back, the whole reason he went here because he wanted some rest he wanted a retreat. He wanted time with his father in prayer. He still hasn't gotten that. And it says then that he made the disciples get onto the boat. And we should just pause long enough to hear that as a good word for us, that sometimes Jesus makes us get onto the boat. Sometimes Jesus makes us to do some things that maybe we don't want to do in the natural. Jesus, if I, he is our Lord, if we are following him, if we have committed ourselves to discipleship, we need to occasionally, I hope not all the time if I'm going to be perfectly honest. I hope this isn't like I'm so disobedient that every day he has to redirect me. But if Jesus isn't making you do some things, I think we have to some, we, we might, you might want to just just take a little moment of prayer in the day or in the week to come and say, am I, am I really listening? Am I really taking the time to listen to your com commands and to strive for obedience? Because I thoroughly believe when I examine my own life that it is really only because Christ has compelled me that I've done certain things. Things. But there's a beauty, there's a joy, there's a sense of release when we're willing to say, I will 
do so. I will follow. I will get into that boat. I will go where you're calling me to go because you say so. Oh, we're going to hear more of that because you say so. But this is the beginning of that command that we should respond to because you say so. What have you done recently because Christ has commanded you? Have you gone and loved a neighbor the way Christ compels you to do? Have you forgiven somebody from whom you hold a grudge because Christ compels you to do it? Have you given generously to a cause because Christ compels you to do it? Have you gone off in service and mission? Have you stepped up and stepped in in the gap to help somebody because Christ's love compels you? Have you walked away from a behavior, from a trait, from an area of your life that you know is not glorifying to God and is not blessing you and is not blessing your neighbor because Christ calls you to do it? Sometimes discipleship demands that we go where simply Jesus says, Go, get into the boat and cross the lake. It doesn't have to make sense. It doesn't always have to make sense. But again, that's the part of faith that we don't want to push so far that it breaks. But my goodness, sometimes, I'll just be honest, I don't want my life to make perfect sense in the natural. I am looking for the supernatural. I'm looking for the revelation. I'm looking for the obedience that takes me beyond my Self, Go and do those things that you wouldn't naturally do because you know, though, that Christ is calling you to do it. Now, it's quite understandable why they might not want to go. Well, one, he's their, he's their master. He's their Lord. They've called him master. They've called him Lord. They've now pledged themselves to follow him. And they wouldn't want to leave him. So it'd be sort of strange that he'd be like, I, you listen, you're just overbearing. Like, get away from me a little bit. <laughs> it's like, there's like, like, I just need some time alone. Uh, I can relate to that. But more so, let's remember that most of these guys, half of these guys, they're, they're fishermen. And they fed the 5,000. The miracle itself would have taken some time if you kind of just go through the logistics of feeding a crowd like that. It was already late in the day. We know that now the sun is setting. It is the end of the day. They can probably see the storm coming. I mean, it doesn't say that in the text, but if it's like the, the sun is set and it's evening and you're a fisherman, you're like, um, yeah, yeah, I, I, yeah, there's a storm coming. Like you really, th this is commanding our obedience all the more because it seems to me that they are looking into the eye of the storm, but they're willing to say, because you say so, Jesus, we will get onto that boat and we will go across that lake, which again, if we ponder the meaning of this sign and what it's pointing out about Jesus and what it's pointing us towards is that sometimes obedience is actually taking us into the storm. And nobody said hallelujah and amen on that one. <laughs> Sometimes obedience is actually going to be that thing that takes us into the storms of life. There's a great prayer that I've prayed often. It's almost become one of these kind of bumper stickers of Christianity, colloquial wheelisms of faith. Uh, Jesus will bring uh, comfort to the afflicted but affliction to the comfortable. Now, I think a lot of us, we come to Jesus in comfort. We come to Jesus in the comfort that he can provide and praise be to God for that. Praise be to God truly that in our times of distress and turmoil, when our health is failing, when our relationships are failing, when our work is failing, when our bank account is failing, when we are failing, when we fall short, when we feel inadequate, less than all that stuff, that he comes to us and he can provide comfort. He can provide peace. He can open up a door for us. He can make a breakthrough for us. He can work a healing miracle for us. Praise be to God that so often we come to faith when he brings us comfort in the afflictions that the world throws on us, right? Have we experienced that? I hope you have. Hallelujah and amen. He does. But there is something certainly about faith that he seems to then, once we're all settled in, right when things are going good, have you ever had that, that experience where somebody tells you how things are going and things are going so good and you tell them about it and then your next thought is, oh man, the other shoe's about to drop. <laughs> What's about to happen now because things are going good? It does seem to be the case that when things get too comfortable, when we're well fed, when Jesus has shown us his power through a miracle, 
when they are ready to crown him king. And the disciples here could be thinking, man, this is firing on all cylinders. Like this is going to be a good deal of discipleship following this guy who works miracles and they're gonna make king. Jesus says, I think you're getting a little too comfortable with what you think is the plan. Time for a storm. If we are examining a lot of our lives, I think the truth of it is, and praise be to this, we, we probably are experiencing a lot more comfort than affliction. You, you, you probably drove here in a car, you're gonna go back to a home where you're gonna have food, you're gonna have TV, you're gonna be able to watch the Olympics or the Super Bowl or rugby tournament. Or I walked in and with all things going on, Chris is watching rugby. I'm like, is there another thing going on in the world that I don't know about? Um, we, for the most part, have very comfortable lives. Our obedience will sometimes bring us into the storm, into those places where we know we need, where we're depending on, we're calling out for the presence, for the hand, for the help of Jesus Christ. And praise be to God for those moments in our life when he meets us in the storm. So there you go, friends. Sometimes obedience is going to take us right into the heart of the storm. And that's exactly what happens as these disciples obey their master and Lord Jesus Christ. It says there in the text, of course, that they've rowed the boat through the night. They've been working through this storm. Uh, we read that they're about three or four miles out. We uh, read that uh, in, I think it was Matthew's uh, text or Mark's text, says that gives us the added insight. It was about the fourth watch of the night, which, oh, that's a whole thing. Like they've gone through all the night and it's always dark darkest before the dawn, as they say. So this has been going on for hours and hours and hours. And then we read this thing, and it's one of these, and we're gonna see this a couple times here now. It's like now the miracle within the miracle within the miracle. We're gonna have layers and layers of miracles here when we, when we really examine this text. It says that Jesus saw them. Jesus saw them in the storm. Now, now, I don't know in the natural, of course, how this happened. They say that if you go to this part of the world and you go to that lake and you go up to the mountain, and if it's a perfectly clear day, that you can actually see all the way over the lake of the Gennesaret there. However, there's a storm and it's the middle of the night. <laughs> It's dark as before the dawn and there are waves crashing against this boat. They say, I don't know how Jesus does it, but there is no night too dark that he does not see his children in the storm. There is no storm too great that he does not see his disciples floundering in that mess. There is no wave too big crashing over our lives that Jesus doesn't see his children. Jesus is watching. The Lord is watching. Every time I read this um, in a book by Mark Batterson, when he deals with this uh, miracle, he says, we're reminded of this every time we pull out a dollar bill. I haven't pulled out a dollar bill, I think, in two years now, but I do remember this, seeing a dollar bill um, back in days past. There is that pyramid, and at the top of the pyramid, there is an eye. And the story of that is that was the founding fathers just wanting to remind us of the eye of providence. The eye of providence, God's providential protection over his children, over his people. God's eye of providence is always upon us. Jesus is watching us. If you are in a storm, you may feel abandoned. It may be a few hours till it breaks. It might still be darkest before that dawn, but Jesus is not unaware of the trials and the tribulations that we go through, and more so what we now read in the text, that Jesus comes to us, that Jesus, when the time is right, never too early, never too late, when the time is right, Jesus comes out to his children. Jesus comes to us. Jesus is walking across the water. I've said it before, why this, why now? I don't know if I could walk on water. I'd do it all the time. It'd be the greatest party trick ever. But Jesus is now showing his command and his control over all of creation, how he sees his children in the storms and is willing to come to them. It says that he went to them. Don't miss how he is going to his disciples in their terror, in their fear, when they're thinking it might all be for naught, he's coming to them, he's coming to us. It will not be too early, it will not be too late. Let us just always profess the faith to which we hold, which we sang beautifully just a moment ago. He will come 
when the time is right. He will come again for us. He's coming to his disciples. But his disciples, they think it's a ghost. And why wouldn't they? If you saw a figure walking across the water in the middle of the storm in the dark of night, you would be pretty freaked out too. There was a kind of a legend that went around in the, this time, uh, in this region, that if you were going to die at sea, that the ghosts, that the spirits, that the uh, forces of the underworld would come and collect you. Now, it was a convenient superstition because if people never came back from a fishing trip, which happens sometimes, of course, then you could say, well, I guess they got taken. And if they made it back, they'd say, did you see any ghosts? And you'd say, no, I didn't see any ghosts. I made it back. So it's one of those things where it's just superstitious. There's just enough like true, like reality maybe in it that is very believable, but it can never be fully backed up. But they're thinking, I guess it's true. I guess this is it. I guess we're about to die. It says they were terrified. And you got to love it. I mean, terrified, screaming out. It is, I, I mean, when was the last time you were terrified? I don't, know, I don't know if you've been terrified recently, but whenever terror truly grips your heart, your mind, your being, I mean, just try to go back to that moment uh, it, just, just to get that sense of what is happening here. They were frightened before, but they're terrified now. They were worried about the storm, but they're terrified that they're dead. I mean, they have gone from bad to worse, but Jesus then calls out, it is I, don't be afraid. But if we look to the literature, if we look to the language of this, it's a little bit more direct. I am, don't be afraid. I am, don't be afraid. And this is so John. This is what we need to see here, what I want you to see here. Take this from home, uh, put this in, circle it in your Bible there, write it in your notes, get it tattooed somewhere on your body. I don't know. Um, uh, G John has done a beautiful job as he's curated and crafted this telling of the life of Jesus. He keeps pulling together this I am theme. Jesus declares to a woman he meets at a well who is far from God, who is, you know, just, just, just life has dealt her some, some horrible, horrible blows and she's made some bad choices. To her, he says, I am the spring of living water. He will go on to tell his disciples, I am the very bread of life. He will tell people that follow him, I am the good shepherd, the one who will bring you into pasture and still water and good rest and restoration. I am in fact the gate to open the doors for eternal life for you. Jesus will say that I am the way. He will say that I am the life. He will say that I am the truth. John keeps highlighting these I am statements of Jesus. And when Jesus says I am these things, he is saying even more. He is connecting himself to the great I am. We have been learning in this Wednesday night Bible study in our journey through Exodus how this is the revelation of God for us. He is the great I am. And Jesus is making this profound, heretical on some levels for many people, but what we believe to be the absolute truth and revelation and he is, in fact, the great I am in flesh and blood now standing before these people walking on the water, coming to them. And, and that is the takeaway for us, this declaration that John wants us to get. And John does a beautiful job sort of just like wrapping to a, a, to a close here because he wants us, he, he doesn't want us to miss that point. I'm gonna say a little bit more because I have a little bit more time. He doesn't want us to miss that point though. I am the great I am. Jesus here is saying, just as the great I am hovered over the waters of creation, there is no problem for me to hover over the waters of this storm because I am the great I am. Just as the great I am brought order out of chaos, it is no trouble for me to bring calm to this storm because I am the great I am. Just as the great I am brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of your captivity, into the promised land, it is no problem for me, Jesus the great I am, to deliver you into the promise of salvation and eternal life. So hallelujah and amen. We worship Jesus the great I am, the king of creation, bringing order out of chaos, delivering us into the promises of God. And that's a great story. But I knew I would have a few 
few more minutes. So I want to tell you a little bit about part two. That's what we learn about Jesus in this story. But Matthew tells us another miracle within the miracle within the miracle. And Matthew's telling, he talks about a little encounter that we have with Peter. And because we talked about Peter in his call last week, I'm going to talk for just a moment about what happens with Peter and what difference it makes in his life and then what difference it can make in our lives, of course. Uh, Peter, we, we met last week. Peter, who was introduced to Jesus by his brother Andrew. Uh, Peter, who was then named Simon. And Jesus says, you will become Peter, the rock on which I build my church. And Peter is so impressed by this that he goes back to fishing. And then we remember that Peter was fishing and then Jesus came to his house and he stayed at his house and Jesus even miraculously healed his mother-in-law and he was so impressed with Jesus that he still went back fishing and finally last week remember that he moved from that familiarity with Jesus to becoming a follower of Jesus he pulled up his boat he dropped his nets he embraced the call I will make you a fisher of people and he begins to follow Jesus Christ now Peter here uh, he has he's all in he's following jesus but you got to love here what, what what happens we get this insight that peter is the one who, who calls out then if it is you lord tell me to come to you and that's that's a great that's a great prayer <laughs> if it is you tell me i think again the call of discipleship, the demand of di discipleship is the willingness to surrender our lives to simply say, tell me, Lord, what to do, and I will do it. There's a beautiful kind of two parts here. He, he is willing to ask, <laughs> and he is willing to act. And that is so much the heart of discipleship, simply being willing to ask. If we really examine our lives, what have we asked of the Lord? What have we offered of ourselves? Have we truly gone to him and asked, Lord, what would you have of me? Lord, what would you make of my life? Lord, what would you have me do with my time? Lord, what would you have me do with my education? Lord, what would you have me do with my marriage? Lord, what would you have me do with my parenting and raising my children? Lord, what would you have me do in my place? Are we really coming and asking the Lord, and are we willing to act on that? And what you gotta love about the story is how Peter here, he is willing to go all in. He is willing to just just, just get out of the boat. And, and that's a great book. There's a great book by John Ortberg, and, and the rub of it is, if you want to walk on water, you've got to get out of the boat. He is willing to ask Jesus, and he is willing to act on the command. Jesus simply says, come. He says, come, and Peter gets out of the boat and he begins to float. He begins to walk on water. And, and it just struck me this week, uh, preparing for this and praying about it and thinking about it. There's a great humor. The Bible is sometimes humorous. The rock is walking on water right now. I, I, I think Jesus had that in mind all along. I'm gonna name you the rock and a couple years from now, you are going to float on water. That is not natural. That is not normal. And what Jesus wants to do with this isn't natural and it isn't in the normal. It can so often be wonderfully extraordinary. You just got to love how the rock floats here. How the rock is walking on water until he isn't. <laughs> so, so like he's crushing it. He's walking on water. He is obeying the call of Jesus Christ. He has stepped out of the boat. He is experiencing a miracle that by my count, two people have experienced Jesus and him in this moment. This is awesome. And again, then it isn't. Because he does what so many of us would do, he simply begins to recognize and realize what is actually happening. And fear sets in. He said he saw the wind, he saw the waves, he sees the circumstances, and he begins to sink. And he says the best prayer that maybe is, you know, one of the best prayers that has ever been prayed, <laughs> save me. There's no eloquence to it. There's no 25 cent theological pastor words to throw out here. There's no need for it. It's just save me. And let us never stray too far from that prayer in any of our lives. Jesus, save me. <laughs> Jesus, save me. Save me from the mess I'm in. Save me from the mess I've made. Save me from the despair. Save me, Lord. Just, it's such a beautiful prayer save me. And then it says, Jesus caught him. 
somehow in that moment, again, I think it's a miracle within the miracle. I don't know what the distance is. I don't know how far this is happening. I, I, I wish I could, you know, we'll get the whole story later. Um, but he begins to sink. But I just love how the text says, Jesus reached out and caught him. Again, Jesus doesn't just see us. Jesus doesn't just come to us. Jesus doesn't just call to us. Jesus is willing to catch us. Jesus is there to catch you. If you feel like you're falling, you feel like you're sinking, if you feel like at your lowest of lows right now, I wanna just pray a prayer before the service is over and we're gonna wrap it up here in just a moment that he is gonna catch you. He is gonna take you by the hand. He's gonna hold you up. He's going to walk along with you and put you back in the place of safety, of his protection, of his care, of his compassion. He's reaching out to catch us when we feel like we are sinking. Hallelujah and amen and praise God for a savior who catches us when we fall short because we do fall short. And Jesus, still being a bit stern here now, and, and we're gonna wrap this up with this one here. He, he, he says this, uh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? You of little faith, why did you doubt? I mean, it's, it's, it's a great question. If you've come this far, if you got out of the boat, if you, if you were walking on water, what happened to take you off that course? But it does. It does happen. We can come off of a great victory in life. We can come off of great successes in life. We can come out of great moments of faithfulness and that the very next moment we seem to stumble and fail. There seems to be a pattern in scripture where Jesus is actually inviting us to be very wary of it, that we can, like the prophet Elijah, fight the prophets on Mount Carmel and win the greatest victory like the people have ever seen. We can call down fire from heaven, you know, and God can act in amazing ways on our behalf. And in the very next moment, we feel like we're running from our lives, afraid from somebody who wanted to kill him, afraid again of the things that come crashing into our lives. He's standing in the midst of this great victory of faith, of walking on water, and yet almost in the natural, in that flesh, in that sense, fear sets in and he begins to sink. But here's the thing that Jesus, I think, is telling us. Jesus can do a lot with a little. If we look at the theme of these miracles, these signs that John has been telling us about, he keeps showing us that he can do a lot if we're willing to give him a little. There can be a multitude of hungry people, but if one boy is willing to come forward with a lunch, Jesus says, I can do a lot with that little bit. And here he's saying, if you can give me a little bit of faith, there's a lot that I can do with that. It's almost like Jesus is telling us, if you give me nothing, if you don't give me something to work with, there's little that I can do in your life. But if you give me that little bit of faith, if you give me that little bit of time, if you give me that little bit of devotion, if you give me that little bit of obedience, if you give me that little bit, there's a lot that I can do with it. Jesus isn't looking for perfection because he'd still be looking for anybody to use to continue his mission and to call and to build his church and to do his work. He isn't looking for perfection. He's looking for a little bit of faith that we are willing to muster up to get us out of the boat and we can go to him. I wanna invite our worship team to come up and then we can continue us in a little bit of uh, worship here. Peter so often gets a bad rap, right? I, I, I don't know where you're at and you know, you've know been around the church for a long time or st still new to all of this. I always feel, I always feel like Peter gets a bad rap from, if you, well, my world, it was this song we talked about, Peter was impetuous, Peter always made a fuss. Anybody remember that one? No, I'm weird. All right, that's fine. You know, you, you know we, we seem to really like to highlight the, the flaws of Peter's life. And, and there's a lot of lessons there, of course. But let's just not forget, of course, that Peter is the one willing to pull up his boat from shore and to follow him. And he became a faithful disciple, the rock on which Jesus would build his church. Peter starts to sink in the midst of the storm, but he was the one who was willing to get out of the boat and trust in faith with him. Peter would, you know, attack some people that were trying to arrest Jesus and say it even would cut off this guy's ear. But at least Peter was willing to step and, and fight for Jesus as Savior and Lord. We get all on Peter's case because he would deny Jesus three times when confronted by a crowd asking if he was a disciple of his. 
But he was the only one willing enough to get close enough to the trial to get caught. <laughs> Peter would be so discouraged, so distraught, so broken after that incident that even after the resurrection, he would then go back again to fishing. And Jesus, as we're going to read, would have to come back and call him out of the boat yet again to be a disciple. But Peter would be the one who would stand up on that day of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit was poured out. He would preach the good news of the resurrection of Jesus Christ and the life that he is offering to us. And it said that more than 3,000 would be added to the church that day. Oh, my friends, Peter is the most awesome example for us because here is a man plagued by deep flaws, by deep doubts, by grave mistakes that surely would have haunted him. But oh my goodness, but he was a man who was able to be used powerfully by God. It seems to me that Peter is a man who said, I will not be defined by the fear that I experienced when Jesus brought forth that miraculous catch, but I will be defined by my decision to follow him. I will not be defined by my fear that caused me to start to sink in that water in that storm but I will be defined by the faith that allowed me to walk on water. I will not be defined for the mistake that I made and the injury that I caused to this guard, but I will be defined by the healing that came through Jesus Christ for him and for me. I will not be defined by this denial that could so easily have plagued him, but I will be defined by the forgiveness of Jesus Christ has offered me. I will not be defined by the failures of my life, but by the forgiveness and the call and the mission that Christ has compelled me to. And so, Peter receives the hand of Jesus. Jesus takes him back into the boat, and it says they worshiped him as the Son of God. And part of the beauty, again, of what John is revealing for us is now this is moved from Jesus, the rabbi, Jesus, their master, Jesus, their Lord, to now Jesus, the one that they know is the son of God and whom they worshiped. So I'm gonna say a prayer and let's worship him too. Ah, oh, Heavenly Father, I thank you for these miracles and I, I, I still confess and feel I'm, I'm working through them and the challenges that they bring, um, but the way that they are stretching uh, my faith and my understanding uh, God, I am grateful that you're just getting bigger. You're just getting greater. You're just getting more in my thoughts and in my life and in my understanding. So I pray that these miracles could be working a miracle in our lives, that it could grow our faith and have us to trust you, that these would be signs for us of who you are and how we might direct our lives. I pray for a faith in each and every one of us now a faith for every man and woman here, a faith that is willing to hear your call and to step out in faith and to trust that with you, we can walk on water. With you, we can experience the miraculous, that we can always call to you and you will reach out and take us and save us and draw you close to yourself. So I pray again, Lord, let us now truly see who you are. You are the Son of God, our Savior and Lord. Let us worship you. Pray this in your name, amen. Why don't we rise once more? Are you hurting and broken within? Overwhelmed by the weight of your sin, Jesus is calling. Have you come to the end of yourself? Do you thirst for a drink from the well? Jesus is calling. Oh, come to the altar, the Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ.
Leave behind your regrets and mistakes. Come today, there's no reason to wait. Jesus is calling. Bring your sorrows and trade them for joy. From the ashes, a new life is born. Jesus is calling. Oh, oh, oh. oh come to the altar. The Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. What a Savior, what a Savior. We sing hallelujah. What a Savior, isn't he wonderful? Sing hallelujah. Christ is risen, bow down before him. Don't be afraid to bow. For he is Lord of all. Sing alleluia. Christ is risen. If it's on your heart, kneel to the Lord. What a Savior, isn't he wonderful? Sing alleluia, is risen. Bow down me for him. Come to the altar, the Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Oh, come to the altar. The Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. The blood of Jesus Christ. Thank Thank you, Lord, for your forgiveness, for your forgiveness. We bring it all to you. Bring it all this morning. We bring it all to you. We step out onto the water. Bear your cross as you wait for the crown. Tell the world of the treasure you found. Amen. Let's give our God some worship, friends. He is worthy. He is worthy. 
I, I think like a giant ice flow or something just rolled off the roof of our church as a sign from God. Um, I don't know what it means, but I'm taking it as a sign to go forth and to walk on water, to trust in him and that we can move mountains and break through ice flows and snow or something like that. I don't know. Hey, we, th- th- what a day, what a day. Wonderful worship. Thank you so much, team. Uh, we got food and a celebration out there. If you don't have anywhere to be, be with us for a little bit. It's going to be a wonderful time. If you're young, come to the young adults party. Uh, I'm going. I'm going to put on baggy pants and uh, a, a, a Snoop Dogg t-shirt and try to fit in. And uh, come to Bible studies, serve with us, fellowship with us, do life with us. Let's be the body of Christ for the world. Amen, friends. Let me uh, give you a benediction here for the way out here. Heavenly Father, we are so grateful for you calling us together to be your people, to be a church, to be members of the very household of God, the body of Christ. And now as we go out to this uh, broken, hurting, lost world, Let we go knowing that we go with the power of the risen Lord and the power of your spirit at work in our lives. And may that power work miracles such that we could even walk on water and do wonders and signs in your name. We pray this in your name, Jesus Christ. Amen. All right, friends, go in peace or join us for the party right out there. (laughs) 